We'll be starting with Priya. Um, is it working, the mic? OK. So um, I thought we'd just raise a couple of issues and spark discussion and questions. So the first point that I wanted to bring up is that in terms of um, sort of the theories and how they are faring in terms of a you know, robust description of the cosmos, the Lambda CDM model seems to be doing spectacularly well. The question is, could there ever be a challenger to this model? In the, in, um, and in particular, what would the criteria for acceptance or rejection of an alternative theory be? So the reason why this is an important question is that Lambda CDM works very well, but there are a few gaps. And some of the major gaps, of course, are that the, we don't understand how and where the initial conditions came from. And of course, we haven't detected the dark matter particle. We don't know what dark matter is or dark energy is. And there are things that we don't understand on the smallest scale physics. The argument has been made that they're all astrophysical processes, but the point is that you know, there are places where the theory might not work. And, but yet, that's acceptable. We ignore that and we say, well, this theory works, right? The question is, if you have an alternative theory, what would the acceptable gaps be, right? And, and in particular, what has been brought up by many speakers so far, and especially earlier this session by uh, Bernard, is what are the issues that crop up, the philosophical issues that crop up in extrapolation of known theories? Into, I mean, is there sort of intellectual discomfort with extrapolation of known laws pushing their domain of validity? And how important is, is testability? And where can we draw the line and say that, you know, so for example, this brings us right to the multiverse question. Right, so it's not testable right now. It may be testable, potentially. But <clears throat> the explanatory power and testability, is there some sort of sweet spot between the two where we are willing to compromise for any gen generic theory that may upend, subsume or upend lambda CDM? Just wanted to bring this up and then, Jana, do you take one? Um, Thank you. So I was going to comment on uh, taking off from what Priya is saying and also um, in relation to some of the things that were talked about today. I think that we're in an incredibly privileged time as cosmologists in that we know so much that we've been able to identify these very important things that we don't know about, namely the dark components. So we can talk about lambda CDM, but we have no idea what that dark energy is. We really don't. We have no idea what the dark matter is. And so there's this beautiful set of clues to a fundamental theory that we know must be beyond the standard model of particle physics. It doesn't fit into the standard model. So I think that's an incredibly fortunate turn of events. I mean, it could have been that we discovered the Higgs and we finished particle physics, and there's no dark energy and no dark matter. That higher theory, in some sense, that earlier high energy theory is still there, but we have zero clues. Um, so what I think is exciting now is to try to take that information, the real observational information, and connect it with fundamental theory. So to, to take off of what Bernard said, um, he said, you know, the most exciting thing in the early universe might be extra dimensions. And so there are models of things like extra dimensions, which might be foisted on us from a string theory, that try to explain the dark energy and try to say, you know, maybe small dimensions are trapping casimir energy. It's not implausible. And that since the extra dimensions are everywhere, this form of dark energy is everywhere. And that there's this, there's this study we have to do to understand how the universe begins democratically with lots of dimensions. Maybe they're all small and try to understand why three become large and why the extra ones, if indeed they exist, become small and stably so. That's actually a very challenging problem. How to stop them from contracting or to stop them from suddenly expanding. And I think um, Ofer Lahav, you asked this interesting question. What about connecting inflation and dark energy? I absolutely agree. We should be not seeing the early universe and extra dimensions and dark energy and dark matter as disparate things. We should try to ask, is there one um, rubric, you know, one uh, a context in which they can all be folded together. So in these examples, for instance, the dark the, the extra dimensions with Casimir energies can actually use them to stabilize. They can be metastable in the early universe so that they inflate, they can tunnel through, drop to a next minimum, etc. Now, 
you know, I'm just using my favorite model. They're highly flawed. But, um, but, but these are important things to try to do. And to ask if the dark matter, for instance, uh, could be something like excitations or modes in these higher dimensional spaces. So I think one of the most important tasks for us as cosmologists is to take very seriously this charge that the observational data is pointing to something fundamental and to try to you know, explore with as few ingredients as possible what we can do with those fundamental theories. And I think that this is a natural place for Pedro. It's a bit like a tag team. Um, so we do have this hope that we can figure out what, it, what is the fundamental theory of dark energy, dark matter. And I'm going to focus on the third thing, which is the fundamental theory of inflation, or the, uh, let me step back, the theory that leads to the large-scale structure of the universe, which we now phrase as inflation. Now, inflation is incredibly simple. It's, you can describe it until, in terms of the dynamics of some, of some scalar fields. You do linear perturbation theory. You do all these wonderful things that work so well in physics, and we know how to do well. And if you twist and squeeze it a little bit, a little bit you get these bizarre initial conditions. You get that the universe is or, you know, almost homogeneous to one part in, in 100,000. And you get this scale invariance spectrum, which is a very bizarre statistical spectrum. I mean, it's, it's super coherent on large scales. It's not thermal. And so it's fantastic. You can do these things, and it fits the data. And the, the, the amazing thing is there really is no alter, alternative. You know, people have pr proposed equiparotic universes, um, string gas dynamics, pre-Big pre Bang, and they all have problems. They're all embryonic, they all have problems, the only game in town is inflation. Um, so much so that it's textbook physics, and it's been textbook fi textbooks physics for, for years. Um, uh, it's easy to work with people, you know, that we had a talk on trying to figure out the classical quantum to classical transition in, in inflation, people look at conceptual problems, people simulate universes based on inflationary initial conditions. It's this robust thing we can work with. Um, but the thing that I've always thought, and a lot of us have always felt, is that inflation is a bit of a stopgap because there's no compelling model um, of inflation. Really, there is no compelling model of inflation. And, you know, and, and one of the ways you see this is if someone comes up with a model of inflation, there's always criticism of it. So there's no, there is no model that, you can, that does not have an unnatural scale, has unnatural dynamics, has a problem with initial conditions. There's really no compelling model of inflation. Um, so we've always thought that it's a stopgap for something better. You know, it's, there's no, it's the only thing, but it's a stopgap. Um, the thing is, people are beginning to win awards for it as the theory. And uh, not only that, you know, for example, at the beginning of this year, BICEP announced their results, and we know that it may not be what it said, but people were talking about Nobel Prize winners. Right? So it's, you know, it's, it's really taken seriously. Now, the worry that I have is that we will never know. We will never be, be able to know if inflation is the right theory, or if any other theory is the right theory. And the reason I say this is because we will never get much more da data than we already have on initial conditions. What, we're basic, what we basically get in terms of initial conditions is an amplitude, a spectral index, maybe a tensor to scalar ratio, and maybe one or two more numbers, but that's it. That's all you get. And if you, you, were, to, if you, were, to look at, you were to look at the progress in our constraints on, for example, the spectral index, in 92, co the COBE constraint was 60%. Um, around the turn of the century, it went down to 9%. In 2009, with WMAP, it, was, it went down to 2%. Six, five years later, it's 1%. And so we're really getting to the limit of what we'll know. You know it's not going to get much better than this. Um, the data, you know, we're basically getting to the point where the data is what it is. We can talk about that the data in 100 years' time is going to get better. It's not. There's a systematic limit and there's a statistical limit. So we're getting there. Um, so then what do you do? And... Uh, well, you, try, you can try and construct other models, but how do you distinguish them from inflation? There's this problem. You can be a Bayesian, and so many of us are Bayesians. But I would, I would suggest you look at this fascinating paper by Rangeval, Martin, Trotter, where they got all the models of inflation on the market, all of them, and they worked out the Bayesian, Bayesian evidence for them, and they figured out that some were better than others, which is fantastic. But then what do you do with that? Do you, do, you, is that, do you work on that? I don't, I don't know of anyone who's given up working on their models and gone down that direction. <laughs> so I think the worry is that basically this is it. And the, the same can be seen, said about dark energy. In 10 years' time, we're going to have all these mega surveys. We're going to reduce our constraints on the, the equation of state. And we're going to get to a point where it's, it's not going to be much better than now. We're not going to be able to say, what's the model of dark energy if it's modified gravity, if there's something else. We're basically there. Thank you. 
Can you hear me? Uh, is everything okay? Thank you. Okay, this is a comment on Bernard Carr's um, lecture about physics and um, the history of physics. And I mean, he drew a very nice picture of physics. He gave a sort of narrative about the history of cosmology. It's very optimistic. It's sort of attractive for physicists. Nevertheless, I think there are some aspects that are wanting, and I want to try to point at these aspects. So I have a couple of comments. Um, the first comment is, I mean, I agree with Bernard on a number of things. For instance, I, I agree, of course, that we have gained knowledge about the smallest scales or very small scales and big scales. Maybe in the philosophy, there are a couple of anti-realists who don't think that we really know about um, atoms and quarks and so on, but I don't think this is any plausible. So fine, to take this home in um, my preferred philosophical jargon, there's often underdetermination. So the evidence is not sufficient to decide between theories or two hypotheses, but that under divination is very often transient. So we gather new evidence and we can decide between the theories and um, so we can say this, this one is the plausible picture. Um, so I agree with many things that Bernard has said, but um, now we come to the sort of more critical remarks. And my second comment is, um, Bernard, you said that um, there's a new nature of science, something like that. And I was very much worried about that. Science is defined as a sort of human endeavor, and as such, it's defined and characterized by certain aims. We want to understand nature, we want to know about nature, and I don't think these sort of very general aims have much changed. Maybe their specification has changed. Um, so I, I don't think that science has as such has changed that much. The nature of science is now different. And I think it's even a sort of very dangerous advertisement to say that, that science has changed. Because, I mean, the, the, the worry is that, I mean, well, I mean, we have now new findings, new theories, and we fine tune our notions of evidence such that, I mean, the new theories are somehow supported by the new evidence. But this is not a nice story. This is a very relativistic picture of science. I, for myself, don't like it, so I, I would be very careful at that point. Um, now you have drawn this nice picture um, with a serpent. I have forgotten the name, sorry about that. Um, but, but I think, I mean, if, if that, that's the main picture, I think certain aspects are missing. And I mean, I, I guess the idea is that this picture is sort of supported first by by, by current physics, what we know about the physical world, but also by the history of physics. And now I want to point out that maybe there are certain critical aspects, maybe the picture is in some sense is misleading, maybe it's not the full picture. So one thing, of course, is that um, there has been talk about the end of physics quite often. So at the end of the 19th century, some people thought that that's it basically for physics. And Bernard, you're somewhat suggesting, well, I mean, that pretty much might be it. Now we have the multiverse, um, maybe Right now, it's still a hypothesis, but in a couple of years, we are there, and that's the end. Why? What's the evidence for that? We have seen these kind of situations very often, well, sometimes in the history of science, so we shouldn't be um, too, too sort of, um, we, we shouldn't think that we are now at the end of physics, or pretty close. Um, and, and the next comment is pretty much related to that one. I mean, you somehow suggested, okay, we have the multiverse, and, and then, yeah, we are there. I mean, you know, the, 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 the tail of the serpent and, and the hat are, are together. But I mean, is, isn't it possible that it goes on and goes on? We can go to even smaller scales, and maybe there's always new physics. Isn't that a sort of picture that, that might be viable and, and that, that, that might actually be the truth? Um, another thing is, um, that of course there are a couple of problems, and I think that has been pointed out in the discussion, uh, where we have not just um, transient underdetermination, but something like persistent underdetermination. And I think uh, Shelley yesterday in his comment gave a very nice example. There are a couple of interpretations of quantum mechanics, and there's just no way to see how we can decide between them on the grounds of evidence. That isn't to say that some um, interpretation is maybe more plausible and that there aren't any arguments in favor or against this interpretation. Um, but I think, I mean, it's, it's difficult to decide this sort of, um, um, with just on the basis on, on evidence. Um, another sort of historical remark um, that was somehow, um, something was missing in the picture and I think what was missing in the picture is that very often in the history of cosmology and in the history of science, I mean, if you have learned about fundamental 
limits, limitations to the knowledge that we can gain. Um, for instance, I mean, George Ellis reminded us about the horizons um, the day before yesterday, and I think these are sort of principled limitations to our knowledge. Um, and, and they are somehow supported by physical laws, what we know about these limits. So I think an honest picture, how physics develops, how cosmology develops, should take that into account. Then there's a sort of different dimension. I mean, you, you showed us the dimension from the very, very small to the very, very large, and I think that's very important, and it's a very nice picture. But then there's a dimension that is somehow related, maybe, but not always. That's a sort of logical dimension. We also want to understand what we observe at the different scales. Quite often we can do so by either going earlier or by moving to smaller particles to explain the sort of macrophysics in terms of microphysics. But I mean, there's a sort of logical problem here. I mean, when, whenever we have some sort of explanation, for instance, we want to understand why is the universe, why, why are there galaxies, okay, we can, can then get back to the initial conditions, and then maybe we can explain the initial conditions, and maybe we can go even further. But I mean, at, at each point, you can always ask, I mean, what, why is this? Why do the condi initial conditions that you sort of postulate or that you claim there to be, why are they as they are? That's always a sort of question that people can ask, and we always want to have a sort of physical explanation, I understand that, but I mean, this sort of business might be unlimited, there might just be no limit, I mean, in principle, it might be possible to, to ge or go even further. Of course, I mean, there are certain theories that are more attractive, maybe this sort of proposal for no, no boundary with no boundaries more attractive than other proposals, but still, I mean, all, even regarding this sort of proposal, you can ask why has it certain features that it has. If it wouldn't have these features, uh, then, then, then it couldn't explain anything at all. And we can ask why does it have these features, and th this, this question is uh, always something one can ask and maybe um, answer. So in, in that dimension, maybe physics is a sort of um, endeavor that is, has no limits. My final remark is um, about the relation between um, physics and philosophy, philosophy of cosmology maybe, and cosmology. Um, you said two things. I mean, you said that um, there's a sort of frontier and that is moving, and you said that it is blurred. I think that there are two things. I mean, they, they somehow fit together, but I mean, logically it would be possible that there's a sharp um, frontier, a sharp um, intersection, um, something like a first order phase transition, um, between physics and philosophy, even if that is moving. Um, l let me comment on, on the picture that um, the, the, this, uh, the distinction between physics and um, philosophy is somehow blurred. I mean, you didn't give any sort of reason, if I understand you correctly. Now, in present philosophy, many people are very attracted by that picture, by the idea that there's only a sort of continuous transition between physics and philosophy, um, that is often called naturalism, and Quine was a pioneer. So the idea is that, I mean, Pine, Quine was sort of trying to um, address people who thought that there's a clear domain of the conceptual, and that's what philosophers are doing, and then there's the empirical realm. And he thought that this sort of um, distinction between the merely conceptual and the empirical um, couldn't be drawn, that it was somehow vague or at least not a sort of sharp um, distinction. I don't agree with Quine's argument, but, but maybe there's something about it. And I, I think man, many people are sort of attracted by, by this picture. I think, I mean, even in this conference, we have seen many examples of philosophy of cosmology that is um, in this sort of naturalistic vein. I think Brian Pitt gave a nice example. I mean, he was, was somehow, if, if I understand it correctly, um, was, was just, I mean, discussing conceptual problems that we have concerning black holes and general relativity and these kind of things. Um, I think this is a nice model for thinking about the uh, relationship between physics, cosmology, and philosophy of cosmology. Um, nevertheless, I mean, I'm somehow dissatisfied, dissatisfied in some respect with this picture. One, one picture, of course, uh, one problem, of course, is, I mean, that it's not very attractive for philosophers. I mean, you know, I mean, they are, so to speak, just, I mean, in the muddy waters of the yet unknown, and, well, Later, physicists take over and they find out the truth. So this is not a very nice uh, view for um, philosophy. And I just want to point out that the couple of people who think that philosophy of cosmology, philosophy in general, should be done in a different way. For instance, Kantian think that uh, any experience has certain preconditions, necessary preconditions, and that the task of philosophy is to find out these sort of 
um, preconditions of any experience or of any science of cosmology and the field of um, the philosophy of cosmology, maybe. And there may be other ideas um, what, what, what philosophy of cosmology could do apart from just clarifying concepts. So, so maybe this is a question really to Bernard. I mean, do, do you think this is the, the only sort of task that philosophy has in relation to cosmology? Or do you think, I mean, there, there's more um, space for philosophy? So that's it. Thank you. OK, so I... I'm wondering if I can uh, attempt any, before we uh, uh, turn it over to those out in the audience, I'm wondering if we can tempt any of the other uh, roundtable members to uh, say a bit more about the, the other talks? No. No? <laughs> no. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that it would, it, from my perspective, I'd be interested in starting a discussion. discussion more so, than having so our views. John, so John Barrow asked me, he wanted to make a comment. He knows what we're going to be doing in 100 years' time. <laughs> Could someone pass him a microphone? <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to make one very quick point, that even if we measure the dark energy equation of state to 1%, 0.1%, 0.01%, .01%, we still don't know what it is. It's not so a lot of information. There's not a lot of information in terms of understanding its nature. I'll give it to John Barrow, and then. Pardon? But we won't measure it with that precision. I don't think we can measure it quite. With that. But we still don't have a complete understanding of the cosmological constant. I think it'd that be, doesn't. Yeah, it'd be easy. To, right, I think I think Priya's point is to to connect with Pedro's point, point. that without with, if that's the only piece of information and we're limiting towards that one piece of information, it's just not enough to discriminate amongst a lot of the ideas out there. Let's give Bernard a, a chance to uh, reply the since door, he was yeah. directly asked a question. Thank you, uh, and uh, I, I'm very uh, flattered, Klaus, that you, you spent so much time talking ab about what I, my own presentation, but I'll try and be brief because it wouldn't be fair to take time. You made many points, so let me just respond to just a few of them. First of all, a business about physics coming to an end at the top. Um, I, I was actually saying the opposite. My own personal view is that, is that science or physics doesn't come to an end at the top. Um, I mean, George was pushing a view that it might, and I was responding to that. But, so I very much think that science will carry on, but I was also emphasizing that science will, in some sense, have to change its nature or at least open up to a broader range of questions. And so when you say you're not convinced that science changes, I mean, I think it's clear that science changes in, in the following sense. I mean, uh, in the early days, an essential part of science was experimentation. But you can't experiment with astronomy but you don't need to because you've got millions of stars and lots of, and, and you sort of can observe many, many stars, many, many galaxies. Okay, so we do away with experimentation, but then we say, well, we have to be able to make observations of lots of systems, but of course, that's fine, but we can't do that for the universe because there's only one universe. And so, and then you say, well, what's left? Well, of course, there is the whole question of verifiability, testability, and I agree entirely with George that that's a crucial um, component. But all I would say is that, first of all, you don't have to insist that every aspect of a theory has to be testable in order to, to say it's, it's valid. Mm -hmm. Or at least that's part of the change of science that you might have to envisage, that not every component is, is testable. And also there's the whole question of, of the time scale of testability, because the point is that there is a time scale to, in which theories can be worked out and tested. Now, for example, string theory, people say, well, string theory after 20 years hasn't solved all the problems, but maybe in another, it, maybe it takes 200 years. But are you going to say that it's not science or physics because it takes 200 years instead of 20 years? It's, it's just a question of, of, you know, what is your criteria of science? And that comes into it. And then just the other point, you know, you, you talked about the division between science and philosophy, or between cosmology and metacosmology. Well, of course, I was being very simplistic. First of all, I was really only, t I wasn't talking about the whole area of philosophy, because obviously philosophy is a, a, an immensely complicated field with all sorts of sub-branches. I was really only talking about the, the, the difference between theories which are regarded as cosmology or phys you know, respectable physics, 
and then theories which are regarded as having a sort of philosophical component in the sense that they can't be tested. I was in no way making any comments about the nature of the whole field of philosophy of science. So there are obviously lots of very interesting, legitimate discussions you can have about the philosophy of science, the philosophy of cosmology, which are independent of that. And I was in no way also using the word metacosmology in a disparaging sense. I wasn't implying that if something is metacosmology, it's bad. It's, it just rep represents the state of the, the world at the moment. I, I do regard um, cosmology, uh, the U multiverse as being metacosmology. My picture was also simplistic because, um, as John Beckman pointed out, the arrow doesn't just go in one way. I mean, so it's not only a matter of metacosmology turning into cosmology. There are plenty of ideas in, in physics which have now gone into metaphysics like the ether and the vista and all those Bennett? sorts of things. But anyway, thank you for all the comments, and that's just a brief reaction. So quickly clarifying, Bernard, are you saying that what counts as an acceptable explanation may change, but an acceptable scientific explanation may change? Is that what you are? Yes? yes? OK. That, that's the point I'm making. Okay. And, uh, but the point George is making, you, you, you have to be very careful that you just don't open the, the gate so wide right. that everything counts, that's including right. astrology. So since there was an invocation of uh, John Barrow by uh, one of our uh, uh, members, I wondered, did you want to reply to his question? <laughs> the which is it was? So I had two comments. One was about this, and I, uh, I think, I mean, Pedro's, uh, I think his pessimism is, is sort of rightly placed. It will be an extraordinarily anti-Copernican situation if we or even our near successors were able to gather all the information mm -hmm. that's needed to solve problems like why the universe is accelerating what are all the fundamental forces. So it, it, it's a rather great expectation. I mean, there could be all sorts of super duper weak fundamental forces in nature that don't affect anything we mm -hmm. see. But if you don't know about them, you won't get the right grand unified theory. And I think the discovery of the acceleration of the universe, let's call it cosmological constant, was a big shock in that respect that something so super weak, as it were, which had been unnoticed, was so totally fundamental and you know, leads you to expect there might be other such things uh, to come. But my 100-year prediction, mm -hmm. so in 100 years, okay, we won't be any cleverer or our successors won't be any cleverer, as it were, in some intrinsic sense as, uh, than Plato or Aristotle or... Um, you know, the people on the stage. But what's going to happen on the time scale of 100 years uh, that's going to progress very quickly is the development of computer technologies and IT and the ability to simulate, you know, in undreamt of ways. So Joel Primek's simulations of making stars uh, will have fantastic dynamic range. They'll be able to deal with the formation of planets and the biologists and the geneticists will join forces and their codes will join the astro codes and you'll be able to simulate also uh, the biochemical evolution on those planets. Uh, and then you might ultimately be able to do things with computer-based intelligence or where AI has developed. Uh, you might have ultimately on that time scale be able to simulate uh, the development of uh, creatures or things uh, which have something that we might call consciousness. And you might therefore even be able to watch the communication between those things in simulations. So I, so I think it's the world of simulation of complexity linking the astro things to us and to minds and to consciousness uh, that in a hundred years' time might be the prime area of fast progress. Uh, it would be surprising if we hadn't solved the other mm. asteroid problems. Uh, there's one caveat, and that is that we haven't, as it were, been given all the answers by some extraterrestrial signals or something, <laughs> which would be a complete disaster. So that would be the right. end of uh, being inquisitive and uh, being human in many respects. So the discovery of super advanced intelligence life will be a disaster in the sense of... Uh, ending a certain type of enterprise. But you, you're not optimistic about our own cognitive abilities being, they're shown to be quite plastic. So over 100 years, our own capabilities might be significantly enhanced. 
aside from the processing power. Even though we, we may be able to mutate ourselves to become smarter. <laughs> no? Um, so, Simon Saunders, um, I, was, I was rather struck by what I thought was the disunity actually among the panel on the optimism front, because I thought Jana and Priya, I thought you were both being really rather optimistic and what a wonderful period we're living in. And, and then Pedro seems to be holding the table. That's his uh, version of optimism. <laughs> <laughs> so, so may I just say, uh, Henrik's talk, he had many wonderful quotes, but um, if there was one he didn't have, let's all rehearse it again. Uh, as subtle is the Lord, um, but he's not malicious. Um, it seems to me that if, infliton, if inflationary cosmology is, is correct, if, um, and the infraton field is somehow forever to be hidden from us, and what's more, the sole impact of inflation is uh, already fully writ in the data, and the data confirms it, and that's it, then this, this would be a malicious Lord. Um, so, and I think if I can just take the, the, the theistic thing out of it, um, this is just somehow methodologically a bad theory. However successful it may be in explaining the signature in the CMB, if, if, if it has these implications, it seems to me that there's really something rather, rather damagingly bad, wrong with this theory. But the thing is, there's no alternative. Well, <laughs> well right. no, look, I'm going to have to say something that David Wallace often says, um, but I never thought to say it to a physicist who I admire as much as you. Uh, never uh, mistake a failure of imagination for necessity. No, 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 I agree, I agree, but there is no alternative. There there is. Can, I, can I just follow up on this? I, I really agree with... Um, oh, there's a call. I really agree with Pedro's uh, take on what we can do by looking very hard at inflation. What I feel optimistic about is the possibility that inadvertently dark energy will tell us something about inflation, right? So that by looking orthogonal to inflation, inadvertently we'll understand, hey, these things are all connected. I mean, that's you know, my prejudice aesthetically, that it's a very low ingredient soup. That's right. what you want. You want as few ingredients mm -hmm. as possible. So it would be beautiful if whatever's driving dark energy is indeed responsible for inflation is somehow connected to dark matter is somehow a fundamental model. theory. Mm -hmm. so, so even if we can't, through the direct parameters, figure out a good inflationary model, maybe through you know, a side door, mm -hmm. we'll actually learn more about it. Optimism. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe it's more a sociological question than a philosophical question, mine, because I, I would like to play the character of the general relativist in the public. Okay. And uh, so ask, ask the question to the panel of what you think uh, um, about... So shall we talk, uh, keep on talking about dark energy or can we just call it uh, cosmological constant? Uh, when I went to, to school, I, was, um, I learned general relativity with the cosmological constant and uh, in uh, quantum gravity we have ways to build up the theory such that in the classical limit there is a cosmological constant. So, of course, you can always go back and uh, find an another way uh, to insert it in a, mo in a more, more fundamental theory, but still it will emerge as a, as a constant in the same way in which G Newton is a constant, in the same way uh, in which the, the Planck length is a constant. So, and, so this is the first part of the question. And since I want to be a very ex extremist uh, general relativist, I, want, I, want, I would like also to ask you what you think, uh, if uh, we can uh, think about the uh, dark matter in terms of uh, uh, something coming again from general relativity, for instance, uh, uh, what are the bounds today um, to uh, primordial black holes? So, uh, up to my knowledge, this hypothesis has not been discarded yet. No, I think, yeah, so I think the primordial black holes as candidates for dark matter has, it doesn't work. They evaporate. They evaporate. Yeah. yeah. So, so they're bright. And Bernard, Bernard's the expert in this, and he mentioned it in his talk. But yeah. but they'd have a very they'd have a very segment. tough time explaining. The only thing is that they perhaps Bernard, you can correct me if I'm, um, I'm not right on this point. They couldn't account for all the dark matter that you see. Yep. There is a very narrow <laughs> very range narrow of masses range, in which yeah. primordial black holes could still provide the dark mass. Um, 
is a narrow mass range around 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18 grams, and another little mass range around about 10 to the 22 grams. Um, above that, they have evaporated, they're too small, they have dynamical and femtolensing constraints. So it's a very narrow range in which they could still be the dark mass. My own favorite candidate, actually, are the Planck mass relics of um, ordinary primordial black holes if quantum gravity somehow stabilizes them. But I mean, that's just purely speculation. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the great thing about primordial black holes is are they essentially are cold dark matter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the sense that they don't interact. So they, they, they in, from, a, from the point of view of, of Joel's simulations, they could just as well be primordial black holes. But um, there's only a narrow mass range, so I can't say that I'm all that optimistic that they would be the dark mass. But they're not completely excluded. But they couldn't contribute for all of the omega dark matter, right? Well, in principle, they could mm. because uh, they, they don't, they're not constrained by nuclear synthesis. Nuclear synthesis. So they could. It, and when I say a narrow range, I mean for making all of the dark mass. No, but the, the, I mean, let me try and rephrase. Are you saying there are already things in general relativity could, that could explain these problems? Sure, but wouldn't you like to know if it is these things? Yes, right. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, so the cosmos. Oh, sorry. No, no, finish your thoughts. And so the, you, you go and look at the data, and you measure the equation of state, and you, you do all these things. And my concern is that if we push it to cosmic variance limited, to systematics limited, we do all these things, the amount of information that we will be able to extract will never be satisfactory, will never be enough. There are a lot of hands. May I encourage the audience to ask brief questions and to state your name at the beginning? Yeah, Tom Banks. Um, Pedro, I did present an alternative to standard inflationary theories. <laughs> but more importantly than that, in our last paper on this, we did an analysis that showed that the situation is even somewhat worse than what you said, because what we actually know about the data can be explained by a few symmetry principles in general cosmological perturbation theory. And so we, we don't know an awful lot. Um, I, d I just wanted to make one other comment, though, that I think is really relevant to a lot of the speculation that goes on in cosmological theory, which is that there's a criterion that I haven't heard anybody talk about, which is to have a, a mathematically coherent theory, and I don't mean rigorous mathematics, but mathematics where I know how to calculate everything that I'm calculating, and I know how to do some systematic correction to whatever approximations that I make. So I can say, is this a good calculation or a bad calculation? The existence of that in string theory was one of the reasons that so many of us were excited about string theory. It, string theory has failed as a theory of our own universe, but we need a, 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 a theory like that in order to be able to have the kind of confidence that we need to go forward in the face of not enough experimental data. And I don't think very many people are thinking along those mm -hmm. lines. Um, so if I could reply to that, I, I agree with you. And I, I'm not a string theorist, but I'm very interested in what comes out, for instance, of a UV complete theory and, and what that might suggest about how the universe is evolving initially. And so it's, it's often, I think, in the background. It's, it's just, as you say, we really we have string theory and we don't really have much else in terms of a UV complete um, picture of, of higher uh, operators and this sort of conversation. So even Pedro and I talk about doing some things that could be pure general relativity, but we do. We stop and we worry. Are there going to be higher operators um, that are generated by a quantum theory? We're not going to be able to suppress them. What's the naturalness issue? So often it's in the background of the conversation, even if it's not the first thing I think we're putting forward. I think cosmologists are concerned about that. If I may, yeah. I agree. I absolutely agree. I, absolutely I just agree. want John Barrow. I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, Don Page, Don Page University of Alberta. Uh, do you do you think there's hope that in a hundred years we could calculate it? I mean, suppose suppose the string M landscape does have you know something like ten to the five hundred vacua. Do you think we could maybe find enough candidates and actually maybe do calculations and check? I mean, if if we if we could get a whole bunch of the presently known constants of physics from some vacuum of this. That would seem to be, you know, and if it fits this, I mean, 
that would seem to be pretty good evidence. But I'm, I'm curious on the computational side, do you think we have any <laughs> hope of doing that in 100 years? Or is that also going to be, is that going to be something that's going to take like 1,000 years? No. I don't know, of course, but if the, I mean, the, but there's a question you mentioned constant. So I think there's an interesting question. Do the true constants of nature live in some much higher dimensional space? In which case, all the work that we do observationally on constants of nature has nothing to do with the fundamental constants of nature. We're just seeing shadows of them. You know, the simple higher dimensional models, if you watched constants in three dimensions, they would vary at the same rate that the mean size of the extra dimensions vary. It's a simple kaluza klein scenario. So I do worry that, you know, if you, if you have extra dimensions, very little of what we observe could be truly fundamental with respect to the, to the constants. I guess so the, the experts may have some ways of somehow getting around that, but um, so we, we are divorced from truly fundamental things by another step once we introduced higher dimensions. Right, but I, I, I was under the assumption that maybe the vacuum would have fairly discrete value. I mean, in other words, that would there be vacuum that be a fairly, a, a fairly stable value? And, and it's, so it's a question of whether, whether we can have both of the calculations. <clears throat> I have a very short question and a very short comment. Very short question is this. You said that inflation, it's a, more or less the only game in, in town and also uh, uh, that uh, all these uh, uh, versions of it. So what is it that, the, the part that seems very well supported? Is it just the fact that there's been most likely a brief period in the history of the universe in which the scale factor grows exponentially? Or more. The two, the two for me, I distill the yeah, two pieces of observational data. No, no, no. If, what, what, what is the consequence of no, these no, pieces it's, of observational it's, data? It's, exactly. Two pieces of observational data are 10 to the minus 5 and scale invariance. Okay? If you quantize linear perturbation theory on a quasi de Sitter background and you have a well, you, you can define the vacuum state pretty much uniquely and you propagate it forward, you get scale invariance. And that's the great prediction from inflation. It should propagate through a period of exponential growth. Exactly. Yeah. So if I discard all the models and I say, suppose there's a piece of, a, a, a part of, a, a moment of exponential growth, this is the part which is. Uh, 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 say that again? The part which is well supported yes. is the fact that during the history of the universe, there was a period of, exactly. in which the exactly. scale yeah. factor. Yes. And yes. if you do linear perturbation theory yes. on that, yes. Good. Yeah. And the comment, the comment is also very brief. Um, Francesca asked, asked about the, 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 the cosmological constant. Uh, uh, why about, about the dark energy? Why don't we call it exponential uh, uh, cosmological constant? And the answer was we have to check it. We have to be sure. Uh, I, I don't want to be a philosopher here, but I learned that at this uh, zero level, you, you falsify theory, you don't confirm theories. You're never going to be sure, of course, right? There's no way of being sure of anything. How are you sure of the Maxwell equation? You're not. Uh, there is a theory that we learned at school that includes a cosmological term. There is a, a, a model, there is a description of the universe with a cosmological term that works so fantastically well, I keep hearing. And then mysteriously, everybody says, oh, could that be true or it's something else? Well, of course it could be something else. Everything could be something else. But why don't we say we have a theory that works very well which is simple, which is the Einstein equation with the cosmological term, which fits the universe so well. And of course, since we're scientists, we look for alternative, we look for contradicting it. Why is the story always different than this one? Isn't it? I think that's the story we tell each other. Well, no, it's yeah. also natural. I mean, you're not concerned about... But you're not concerned that, that quantum corrections would argue it being very large or zero, you know, I mean, maybe we don't really care about natural. No, it's the particular value. It's a particular, particular value. value. The particular <laughs> measured value. So forget quantum field theory. There's this classical constant, there's this yeah. classical constant that you put in there, yeah. which is orders of magnitude away from all the other constants, hugely away. Right. Fine. No, you have no problem with it. Other people do. <laughs> right. Okay. We have one other last question. That no, we no, no. But let me just finish this. Yeah. Um, other people do. 
There's another possibility, that it, there's something dynamical that evolves towards that. Supposedly less fine-tuned, I don't think it's yeah, much less fine-tuned, but it's another possibility. It has some kind of observational signature. Let's call it quintessence. You go away and you look for this. But I, I think you're telling the same story. I mean, yeah. you're happy with the cosmological constant. Other people aren't. I don't think there's... I, I don't think you can say it's the cosmological constant, constant. because I find it's fine. Okay, last question. Fresh? No? Um, if, if, if we're putting in a shopping list of things we'd like in 100 years, gravitational wave detectors, I've heard oh, yeah. uh, Kip sure. Thorne talk about those. Um, as, as, as John said, uh, galaxy formation's got an awfully long way to go, but eventually, if we understand the baryonic physics well enough, it can feed back into cosmology. Um, so the more general point there is that theory often tells you what you should do with your data, that you don't see a pattern that makes, that, 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 that uh, you, you should be seeing until the theory tells you what to look for. Um, so the, f the fact that we don't have a theory of quantum gravity, the fact that there's gaps in the standard model, um, I, I think these are all, uh, the, the gaps in the theory uh, uh, could open up observational gaps, but, um, so, I mean, I'm not entirely sure what my question is. You know, uh, what, what, uh, should we therefore be putting more effort into, as a cosmological theorist, into cosmological theory? I mean, is that, is that where the things open up in the next hundred years? Um, I, I, I have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> I well, I mean, that. I think that the relationship between uh, observational evidence and theory building has shifted as the theory has become much more mature. So I think it would be simplistic to say, let's focus on the theory and then let's see what, I think they're gonna go in tandem because it is a mature theory and to fill the gaps, sometimes we may have to look for empirical yeah. uh, epiphanies to illuminate what. Can I just respond to the gravitational wave part? I mean, I, I would love it if yeah. gravitational waves became advanced enough that we could look at things that interact purely gravitationally that we can't see any other way. I mean, that would be, that's the goal, right? And so dark matter, maybe we could see it in the gravitational waves because we specifically can't see it through light. That's why we call it dark. Right? This would be exciting if we could think of ways that phase transitions in the early universe do leave a signature in the gravitational waves. And this has been very hard to do at a level that's detectable. That, that, that's all. It's a little discouraging, right? It's hard enough to see big black holes Cold crashing smoke. together in our backyard. Um, so, um, but it's not hopeless, and I do, I do think people are investing energy in thinking about that. Yeah, I mean, at least we'll have to uh, wrap up. I'm yeah. sorry to those of you whose questions. At least for me, that's the fondest to. hope that the gravitational wave window will open within the next 20, 30 years. So uh, let's uh, thank the panel again. Thank you.